will never forget the moment I tried to build my first neural network. I was like a chef with a recipe, throwing in ingredients from the documentation without knowing how they would mix together. I followed some tutorials and ended up running it, but I couldn't convert it to a fully fledged system for some other projects without understanding the basics of what actually happens behind the code. You know, the boring stuff most students try to run away from. Have you ever tried to assemble a puzzle without looking at the picture on the box? That's exactly what it feels like to build a neural network without a deeper understanding of its fundamentals. You might get lucky and stumble upon the right combination, but more often than not, you will end up with a mess. And no matter how many tutorials you watch or blogs you read, you just couldn't seem to get some parts of your projects right. That's when I realized that mastering the fundamentals of AI is like mastering a new language. You need to start with the basics. For me, that meant that I needed to take a step back and grasp the five key concepts that form the backbone of AI that I will be sharing with you today. If you also find yourself in this situation or you're feeling overwhelmed by the amount of AI related terms and systems out there, all you need is to spend the next couple of minutes watching this video where I will take you on a journey to explore each of these concepts and show you how they fit together like pieces of a puzzle. By the end of it, you will have a better understanding of how AI works and you will be able to build your own neural networks with confidence. For me, the journey to understanding AI started with understanding the input and how it travels through a simple neural network, also called a feed-forward neural network. The input to a neural network can be anything, such as a sequence of words or tokens from a text, pixels in an image, or audio signals. Now, imagine our input data is the sentence, I watch all videos from analytics camp, where the word I is our first input word or X1, all the way to the last word or camps as X7. If you've seen my previous videos about how neural networks work, you know that each input data is multiplied by a numerical value called weight. But wait a minute, how do we multiply a word by a number? In machine learning lingo, this is called embedding. In earlier days of machine learning, we used to use a simple method called one-hot encoding to encode categorical inputs such as words in a sentence in numerical form. All we used to do was construct a vector with the length of the total vocabulary we have. For the sake of simplicity, let's imagine that we only have these seven words in our vocabulary. So we have to represent each word with a vector of length seven, where that word's position in the sentence gets the value of one and the rest of the positions get zeros. This didn't end up as a useful solution for natural language processing, as it was inefficient to waste so much space in memory for all those extra zeros, especially with a larger vocabulary such as a million word dataset. This method also didn't capture the similarity of words in a vector space because all vectors end up having the same distance from each other. So we couldn't capture contextual meaning with this type of vector representation. Computational linguists then came up with more efficient methods to embed words for a neural network such as word to wake and glove that allowed us to capture the words relationships and similarities. Today we are taking this to the next level with techniques like BERT and Roberta, which use self-supervised learning to learn context-aware representations of words and is revolutionizing the way we build NLP models. I will not get into their details here because I'm making a longer detailed video about this soon. For now, we managed to learn what embedding really is and how we represent different types of input data as numerical values. So let's jump into the second most important concept in AI, which is the concepts of weight and bias in a neural network. Imagine you're trying to perfect a recipe for a fluffy croissant. You've got all the ingredients, but the key to success lies in the delicate balance of flour, salt, sugar, and butter. Too much of one and the whole dish is thrown off. That's basically what's happening in a neural network, where the weights and biases are the secret ingredients that help the network come up with an accurate response. 
Weights are like the ratio of flour to water in a croissant dough. They determine how much importance to give to each input feature so that the network can learn to recognize patterns in the data and make predictions. But weights alone aren't enough. You need biases to balance them out. Biases are also numerical values as constants, which are added to the weighted sum of the inputs in order to offset the result before the input travels to a neuron. In a neural network, each connection between two neurons is given a unique weight, a multiplier that increases or decreases the neuron's contribution to the neuron in the following layer. Both weights and biases will be tweaked through the backward process in the neural network flow to adjust the importance each word plays in predicting the result more accurately. The next important concept is the activation function, which is tightly related to how the weighted sum of inputs plus the bias term travels to the neurons of the hidden layers. You can think of each neuron or node in a layer as an activation function that maps this output value, usually in a range of 0 to 1 or minus 1 to 1, and sends the results as the new input for the next neurons in the next layer. Activation functions are nonlinear mathematical functions that can learn nonlinear patterns in the data. Here's where neural networks with nonlinear activation functions shine. They reveal complex relationships between variables in your data that cannot be simply understood linearly, for example, with a line. This is because most real world data is nonlinear. For example, the relationship between product prices and various geopolitical events in real time, or your future income based on your present level of skills, motivation, and geographical location. Each of these and other activation functions is suitable for different use cases. For binary classification of, let's say, cats and dogs images, you'd rather use the sigmoid function. But when you have multiple types of classes to distinguish from each other, you'd better off with softmax. Just as the understanding of activation functions and how they process input data and send them off to the next layer is very crucial, so is the understanding of the next important concept, or the loss function. After repeating the previous process in the entire forward pass of the neural network, the last layer or the output layer will give you an output or response, usually a prediction. A loss function measures the difference or loss between the model's predicted output for a given input and the correct predictions or ground truths for that input. In other words, it measures how different the model's actual output is from the desired output. The goal of this loss or cost function is to find inaccuracy in a way that appropriately reflects both the nature and magnitude of the error of the model's output for each input. Different mathematical formulas for loss are used for different tasks. For example, different variations of mean squared error work well for regression problems, whereas classification problems are better off with the variations of cross-entropy loss. But you won't be able to fully grasp the concept of loss function without understanding the last important concept in this video or backpropagation with gradient descent. Imagine you're a hiker standing at the summit of a mountain. Your goal is to get back to where you started, but you don't have a map. And the terrain seems to be changing because of the foggy weather. You can't see very far ahead and every step you take seems to lead you deeper into uncertainty. So what's the solution? Gradient descent is an algorithm that helps you navigate the complexities of neural networks by finding the optimal direction to take with each step. It's like having a map that constantly updates its view of the terrain, showing you which direction to take to minimize the error. During the backpropagation, the network uses an algorithm called gradient descent, whose job is to find the most optimal values for the weights or importance given to each input data at each connection and device terms, so that the next time the network can predict the accurate output or at least reduces the error or loss between what it predicts and what it should be. The gradient descent algorithm effectively moves these weight and bias parameters in the opposite direction of the gradients of the loss function until the gradient of the loss function approaches zero. 
At this point where the loss or error is ideally zero or very, very small, the weight value is ideal because now we found how much importance in the numerical value we should give to each input data to minimize the error it contributes to the final prediction of the neural network. And surprise, surprise, we get a more accurate response. What this means is that because the gradients are in the direction of the increase of the loss or cost function, if we move the parameters in the opposite direction, we get smaller error values. Therefore, the cost function will give us a smaller value and therefore we manage to reduce the gap between the previously incorrect output and the expected correct output. So essentially during backpropagation or the backward pass, we can easily estimate the impact of changes to any specific weight in the neural network by simply completing a forward pass for two slightly different values of this weight while keeping all other parameters unchanged and comparing the resulting loss for each pass. This means that working backwards from the model's predicted output, Backprop applies the chain rule to find out the influence of changes to each individual neural network parameter, such as weights, on the overall error of the model's predictions. The end result of this process is a more accurate response or prediction by your model. In real-world scenarios, neural networks typically have tens or hundreds of layers, thousands of weights and biases, and are trained on massive datasets. So you can see how using these five strategies can significantly improve the model's accuracy and efficiency. To be honest, backpropagation has a really fascinating story behind it, including a lengthy dramatic battle about who invented it. Here's the video about it. Believe me, you don't want to miss it.